Once again, this episode is being brought to you by Diesel Fuel Prints. Diesel Fuel has been in the business since 1991, and Andy has been printing all of my stickers since the early 2000s. He's been a guest on this show, and he's a friend and somebody I've worked with for a long time. So I can highly vouch for his business because I use it myself. Highest quality, weatherproof stickers, easy online ordering, and quotes on any size and shape sticker you can think of. Full color printing and 125 black and white stickers start as low as $25. Free shipping on all orders at dieselfuelprints.com. And my listeners get a 10% discount if they use the promo code AWP2021. Check out Andy and his stickers. He does a great job. Let's get to the episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Anyway Whatever podcast. I'm your host, Mike Fisher. And today's guest is Vinny Fiorello of paper and plastic records. Vinny was a fan of the show and his label came to me to have him be on as a guest. And I was, you know, that's awesome. He was the drummer in Less Than Jake for a long time. And he's also in a band called The Inevitables. Uh, what I didn't know about Vinny was that he's also a visual artist. And, you know, he works a little bit also in vinyl toys and custom resin toys. Really interesting, cool guy. We were like instant friends. Uh, just an insanely cool dude. Really had a good time sitting and talking with him. I think you guys are really going to like this episode. There will be links to all of his social media below so you can follow him and see all the cool stuff that he's got going on. Uh, there will also, in the links below, be all of the stuff that has to do with the podcast, the merch, the Patreon, the shirts, and all of that stuff where you can find this show. And if you are watching on YouTube, give us a like. Everywhere else, share and comment and uh you know give us a review wherever it is you get your wherever it is you're getting this show uh great episode with Vinny Fiorello paper and plastic and lesson Jake and uh can't wait for you guys to get to it so let's get to it Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm your host Mike as always, and today's guest is Vinny Fiorello of Paper and Plastic Records. What's up, dude? How are you? You know what? I, I can't complain. I'm in uh Gainesville, Florida right now, and it uh it's summer. It's summer. <laughs> like it's 80, 88 degrees today, and uh but I'm in that awkward stage where it's like forty three degrees in the morning. And then it jumps like 40 degrees and I'm sweating. Like, look, I have long sleeves and I have a winter hat. I took a dog out. I was like looking like a, a neighborhood lunatic. Like, <laughs> So there, there it is. But other than that, good, good. <laughs> yeah, we kind of are going through the same thing in L.A. where it's like 50 when I get up at like 630 in the morning. And then it's like 86 <laughs> in the <Yeah>. afternoon. <laughs> um, so, uh the one of the things about paper and plastic that I found to be super interesting right out of the gate was that um, you guys do so much more than just a record label. You have toys and all sorts of stuff going on. Is, is paper and plastic kind of just like all of your passion projects go into that one kind of venue? Yeah. I mean, it's it's an umbrella, right? You know, for me, it's it's in the name. It's paper and it's plastic. It's it's you know everything from books and comic books, graphic novels, vinyl records. It's resin toys, production toys, and you know, go down the line. It's anything that I love and I'm passionate about. Uh, I put underneath that umbrella, right? And sometimes sometimes it's prints, and sometimes it's by myself. And other times I find artists that are friends and uh, we do cool and creative things. Well, cool to me and other people, but, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it, it's odd because I've, I've put out a lot of records. Uh, I had uh, started and owned uh, Fueled by Ramen, and that was more of a conventional record label, right, where it was we're, we're going to we're going to sign bands or we're going to try to get them bigger and. Uh, we're going to go through all of that where when I left and I sold uh, my half of that, I, I wanted to come back and do something creative, but I didn't want it to have 
everything attached <clears throat> to it, right? So uh, I just kind of ran with, let's do it all. You know, everything from, from grindy, weird metal to uh, fast, melodic pop punk and everything in between that. Yeah, you, you have a couple bands that I that I like on your label. From Hell and um, Hellmouth are both bands that are like kind of in my wheelhouse, especially Hellmouth. Hellmouth is really good. They're not too far away from my last band, DIS. They're kind of like crusty, um, hardcore. And um, you know, I, you know, one of the things that that we were kind of talking about before we got going, and um, uh, Vinny was the drummer in the ska punk band. Um, less than Jake for 27 years. And so, um, I was, when, when we were connected together, I was like, Oh, you know, his life is probably going to be a bunch of ska punk bands. And so when I went through and started like, um, going through the roster, I was like, Oh, I know a bunch of these bands. These are just like, a lot of these bands are just like hardcore bands and, you know, metal bands. And I was, I was surprised at the range of different types of bands you had. And then of course, like, Oh, they have toys and you know, they have these cool prints and I was, you know, it's awesome. I love stuff like that where it's unconventional and you're kind of just like, you're putting out stuff that you like. Yeah. I and mean, that's, that's more that, important that's, than like some weird tight brand, you know, it, it has to be like that. Right. Because it's, it's what you're passionate about. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm just not a, a, a someone who, just love ska music. I'm someone who loves old punk rock. And I went through, we talked about it briefly, you know, you went through your like speed metal and then faster and faster. I did the same thing, you know, when I was, when I found punk rock music, that was the first record that I bought with my own money, punk record, not anything else, but punk record was DRI Violent Pacification 7 inch. Nice. The second record that I bought was Stormtroopers of Death Speak English or Die. And uh, I went everything, you know, faster, Napalm Death and Scum and, you know, mm -hmm. DSI because well, I'm in Florida. So, of course, <laughs> I like metal, right? Of and, and course, the metal. Florida death metal. Of course. <laughs> but I, I also like a lot of things that are a little bit, you know, slower and vibier. I love reggae music. I, I love ska music. I love melodic punk rock music. I love melodic hardcore. And whatever, I bring it in and... And whatever I like, I hold. And whatever that doesn't move me, it's not that it's bad. It just goes over to the side. And that's the same thing as books and uh, visual art in any kind of a way. I, I like what I like, and I don't ever claim that I only like in that lane. I like to be in many lanes. That's that. I like that. Um, for a long time, I got, uh, as an artist, sometimes it pays to br kind of brand yourself a little bit and so for me for for like all of the 2000s i was like just like i'm the death metal and black metal guy and grindcore guy and um and i and i didn't get outside of my lane as much as i probably should have and then you know when my last band when i left my last band in 2011 um i kind of intentionally got away from listening to a lot of that type of music because I had just been so, you know, drowned in it, you know, like, yeah. you know, when you're on tour, you go, you get to, you get to the venue, you're, you are going to sit through five bands before you get to play or wow. they're going to play after you play. And so it's like just for years of just like, I don't want to listen to death metal at all right now or grindcore or any of that and uh, one of the things that's happened for me that's been really really amazing for me is I, i'm just i have gotten more open-minded about life in general as i've gotten older and I, I started branching out in the last five six seven years into things that i would have never listened to a decade ago uh, like, you know, I listen to a lot of like old jazz now, like, you know, Brubeck and Mingus and Miles Davis and stuff. Uh -huh. And like, even my kids are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what? Um, and then like, you know, like I've, I've gotten into a lot of like, uh, like, you know, old psych garage rock and um, just a lot more melodic music old funk music, even stuff like old, like swing jazz, like Django Reinhardt and stuff, just all different types of stuff, you know? And it's like 10 years ago, if you came into my art studio, you were going to get pounded 
by something super fast, heavy and loud. Oh. <laughs> and now you come in and it's like, you might get James Brown. <laughs> you might get, you know, you might get Django Reinhardt or you might get, you know, like LA witch, like some weird psych, you know, rock band. Like I, you know, I, I have, I make a Spotify playlist every week of whatever it is that I have listened to in the art studio. And I kind of try to put two songs by every artist or, or in a style. And so people who listen to the show are probably somewhat aware that if you follow me on Spotify, uh, there's like 250 playlists that are two hours long that (laughs) you're going to, and I, I think the, the idea is that if you listen to them, no matter who you are, you're probably going to learn something you didn't know. And, uh, and so I like that. That's that, that is a great thing. You know, it's that, you know, you just can't, you know, paint a picture with one color, right? I mean, you can surely try, right? But, you know, as I get older as well, I, I like many colors, man, and, and I want to fill up what I can, you know, and it's just not this one thing. It's it's many things. And uh, I, I, I give people credit, man. I give people credit that, you know, if you mentioned swing, but let's go back to like whatever. I, I give credit to people who go, I'm dressing this way. I'm <laughs> acting this way. My lifestyle is this way, and it matches my music. I dude, sure. I, if you could do that, and, and you could be happy and content, then then yeah, that's awesome, right? I I could just never imagine me. Okay, I'm gonna you know I I played in a, a ska band, you know ska punk band. Can't imagine myself. I'm gonna do a mohawk. I'm gonna have a suit on. I'm gonna you know have the thing like and. <laughs> Not that it's a bad thing, because it's not. I, I commend those people who can do that. I just could never paint myself into that corner. It just, I would never feel comfortable. I would feel like a fucking fraud doing that. Right. Like, you know, it's like one of those things. I was talking to somebody on the show about it a while ago, and it's like, you know, kind of everybody, when they get into to punk rock or whatever, like you go through the initial like uniform stage, you know what I mean? Like everybody kind of does. And then after you've been around it for enough, you realize that that isn't at all, you know, kind of what it's about. And, and agree. And again, I agree with you. I have friends who are my age, 50 years old, who still have mohawks and still like, you know, they're still wearing bondage pants and that's rad. Like I, I love that. And, you know, like I have friends who are my age who are still like death metal dudes with leather pants and spiky bracelets and all that shit. And that is all like, I love all that, but you know, I figured out like after the first, like two years, like, Oh, I don't need to have blue hair for the, for, to be a punk rocker. Like I am because I am, you know, and it's like, but that's the great thing about life too, is like, and we, we kind of were talking about this a little bit before we got going where like, it's become important to me as, as an, a grown adult that I don't put that my taste isn't an indictment of somebody else's taste or way of life. Like do your thing. Like it, I get stoked on people being stoked on whatever it is they they're doing, whether it's driving a race car or having a purple Mohawk or, you know, like, you know, making TikTok video, whatever you get stoked on. If you're, if it makes you happy and you're not hurting anybody else, I'm, I'm yeah. on your team. Even if it's something I don't care about, you know, I, I, I am with you 100%. I, I, I don't like people who try to put it in a box and try to define it. Right. Why are you trying to define it? You know, you're trying to define somebody else's, you know, happiness or success or something and through your filter and your lens. I mean, that seems silly, right? Because I can tell you right now, the, the punkest guy that I know is vice president of a bank, Chase, right? And like, <laughs> dude, dude, dude is 60 plus years old and the, the punkest motherfucker that I know, right? And he, and I'm not like, he's not trying to define himself. I'm not trying to define him, but I'm just saying that like, you know, if you looked at him on the street, you'd be like, that's my like grandpa, like cruising by who maybe like the edgiest thing kind of like Elvis Costello, like as a thin tie, <laughs> like, but that guy is, uh, the, you know, most independent uh, free thinker that I know, man. And, and thumbs his nose to like the convention. Right. But happens to be a vice president of the bank. And, you know, and that's just it. I, I'm not here. I, I don't feel that I've been put here to judge other people of how they live and why they're doing what they're doing. I'm I'm here to go celebrate. You you love punk rock music and that makes you happy? So do I. Let's let's celebrate that <laughs> together. You know, if, if you like this type of art, well so do I or I don't, but show me why you like it. And 
I, I, I'm here now to to go. Yeah, like I, I want I want to be educated more, but I also want to celebrate all the things that are awesome. Absolutely, dude. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's you know, and maybe some of this comes is like age of wisdom, wisdom with age type of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things that always kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of a thing that bugs me about anything is like when other people try to tell you you're not doing the thing right. You know, it's like the gag gatekeeperism that that yeah. happens a lot, where it's like that's not punk rock or no punk rocker would like or do that or you know what i mean or or like it's really bad in the metal scene where it's like that's not death metal that's blackened death metal <laughs> you know what i mean it's like there's so many subgenres and there's so many people who are so nerdy about it and i used to i used to be one of those people like admittedly and i don't know i just i just you know, I just want people to do their thing and not worry about what other people think about it. And I, I mean, I, I'm in a, I'm, I'm in an art message board uh, that has like a lot of like really big heavy hitters in it, and it's like there's a lot of conversation about you know what is you know what is or isn't you know appropriate for this genre of art, and it's like man, I just want people to care less about shit like that. You know what I mean? It's like that people do have, do their thing, how they do it. You know, you know? Yeah. The, the, the thing that, that you really could live on uh, and in like sub genres of, of, of music. Now you, you can live on, I only like Scott punk music. I don't go out of it. I only talk to people who like that. And I could live in that like small, like, layer of music right and the same thing goes for 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 metal and the same thing goes for rock and roll and jazz i only like hip hop you know, all pre, that stuff you know pre-72 jazz and that's what i'm gonna live and there's bars and there's scenes that like cater to that and you can just live there right but i i, I i've never been to that and I, I don't get my head around it and i don't quite understand it i don't condemn it and i don't think i just there's so much more like than, than <laughs> right know. But on the art thing, though, to me, you know, especially now where people, you, you know, the, the big thing for a few friends that are artists that I know, the NFT, NFT, and then there's a whole bunch of other people like, that's fucking bullshit. Like, what are you trying to do? Like, and then there's other people are like, it's finally our time. It's finally our time <laughs> to like ride this, ride the wave. And uh, yeah, yeah, I have I, some friends who are doing really well with NFT stuff right now, like several friends and then several other friends who like want to light them on fire for doing it. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. fuck man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. NFT thing is very interesting. I looked into it at first and I was like, ah, it just, uh, you know, I, I've, I've taught, I've brought this up. It kind of comes up on the show a little bit is that, um, at some point uh, when I decided to, to leave my day job and just exist as an artist, uh, rather than, uh, kind of hone down in on like one thing, like, and try to make my name known for this one thing, you know, like a Kozik or a, you know, uh, Chet Czar or some, you know what I mean? Like an artist where you hear their name and you immediately know what their work is. Uh, I decided that uh, I would be better off um, being an overall problem solver. Like if you bring me a project, it doesn't really matter what it is. I, I can figure out how to, to solve it for you. And uh, one of the, one of the things, so like people hear my name and they don't necessarily know anything about what I do, but almost everybody you know has artwork that I've made in their record collection or their t-shirt collection or any of that stuff. And it's yeah. like, so I just kind of became like a problem solver in the art world. And um, one of the things that's been really cool for me with that is like, you know, like as much as, you know, we kind of talked about it and I did, I, and I was like really conscious of trying to not be an asshole about it. And all of my listeners and friends who are listening, who know that I don't particularly like Scott punk music. Um, but I also really don't care much for country music. Uh, but I will say that no matter what type of music it is, I know the real thing when I hear it. Uh, and so it doesn't really matter if it's a genre of music I like or don't like. If I know when I'm hearing the real thing, uh -huh. you know, and it's like uh, I have a friend who owns a record label in um, Kentucky called 
um, La Honda Records, and she is putting out all these records by these new, young, 20-something-year-old country people who play like 60s, 70s style, old school country. And I won't use the term outlaw country because I think that's corny, but it's like, you know, you know, she puts out people who sound a lot like, like Willie and Waylon and stuff like that. And she comes to me to design stuff for these people. And, you know, me and her very good friends for 20 years, shout out Connie Collinsworth. And, uh, and she knows that I don't love country, but she knows I love her country artists. But so like, I got, I got, I got really good at doing, uh, design work for country music, which is a kind of music I don't really particularly like or care for. And the same thing with like pop music. Like, you know, I did shirts for Rihanna and, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't know if I've ever heard a Rihanna song, but you know, except for when I'm working on it, I'll listen. But, you know, it's, that's kind of one of the cool things about kind of breaking out of my shell is that I've gotten to do work for all these different types of people I would have never dreamed mm-hmm. uh, 10, 15 years ago that I would. And, you know, you know, to kind of tie it back in a little bit to where we started the conversation, like I, I, that's why when I looked at your website for the, for paper and plastic, it really immediately struck me as something cool because I could relate immediately to like, oh, wow, this is cool. It's like, you're like doing all kinds of cool stuff uh, and not staying in, in this little box because even though my, I try to be open-minded, I was being closed-minded. I was like, oh, it's going to be a bunch of Scott Punk stuff. <laughs> and then it like was so totally not that. And I was like, you know, I would have been happy for you either way. But you know what? It, it's, it's cool, number one, that, that what you're saying, you, you know, think of yourself as like sort of like a Swiss army knife for like, you know, artwork and design work. Because that to me is, is a righteous way to like sort of, present yourself. Oh, there's an issue or there's a project. Let me like jump in and let me figure it out. Right. But like, even in like beyond that, like beyond that, that work for, for higher design work for higher, just that in general, man, is a cool way to be like on the creative side, because you're taking it in, you use your filter and then you push it out. Right. And there's some ways like that you go, Oh, I, 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 I love this. So I'm going to apply it back to what I usually do, you know, and, oh yeah, you know, there, there's just, you know, on, on Instagram, I, I have a few artists that I always like, you know, watch and I, Oh, and, and they're doing this. And I, I, I like to sometimes, uh, not that I would use the style or cop the style, but the, how they're presenting it and those little bit, bits and pieces on social media, when I pick up on it, I go, Oh, now like just have this little thing I could bring into my like arsenal of stuff and, and the way it is, you know, and, uh, it, it's just, it's just wild, man. Like, you know, there's, uh, Jim Madison, like, which is, <laughs> which, yeah. which is, which is friends with Connie, right? Like, uh, they yeah, were they, were, forever, they were partners and, forever. <laughs> Jim's and, a good friend. And, and Jim, I, I watch, I, I watch Jim every morning. I, he has his ritual thing where he turns on the speaker and I get up in the morning and I watch him do it. And sometimes we, you know, we go back and forth, but he's been, you know, since I found his account, he's been a source of inspiration to always push forward, push forward, push forward. And I, I have to say, there's not that many like things that push me like his Instagram account does, you know, and he's a creative, but he's pushing it through his filter and then he's actually doing it and it makes me want to do more. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to find and be able to apply to my daily. Right. <clears throat> totally. Con- Connie and Jim both when, they, when I, I met them when they were doing print mafia stuff, yeah. um, you know, 20 years ago. And they, they like uh, both of them are daily inspirations to me, not just as an artist and a creative person, just as people. They are two of my favorite people who have ever, oh. I've ever known in my entire life. Um, I actually got to talk to Connie on the phone yesterday, which was mm-hmm. awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that you are connected to them and stoked on them because they, they're, rad (laughs) they're both so good inspiring man and inspiring to do it and you know it's that even you know go uh, across you know to something completely different but alex pardee like one of my favorite artists but 
the, the way that he goes about creating and the way that he is able to sort of present it on social media, it, it's inspiring as well. Completely different than what, what Jim's doing, right? But just super inspiring. And uh, that, those are the things that I look for on a daily to like kind of bring in and go, oh, you should, you know, you're, you're kind of like stuck in this headspace. You need other stimulus to come in and ricochet and, and make you go into a different direction. And I, I've been doing that, you know, in, in my own way for, you know, 30 years of, of with Muse between music and different art and toys. And I, I like when I find something that makes me, it hits me in a way that sends me in a completely opposite direction that I was headed. And that that's truly beautiful. And, and it's, sometimes it's easier to find because of social media these days, you know, and, and I, I yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, just on, on part D, like he, I think he was probably the first artist I can remember watching make a huge, massive career through social media. That dude figured yeah. it out before kind of anybody else and just killed it. And you know what? I've listened to him on a bunch of podcasts and he seems like a super nice guy. And I like that too, you know, that just to know that like, it's kind of like him and Skinner are like in that they occupy the same space in my mind in that way where they're like, they're just nice, helpful, honest, you know, people who are doing as much for the art community as they are for their own career. And, um, I, I definitely get inspired by, by the both of them in that way where, you know, me and Skinner for a long time would, I wouldn't use the word compete, but we would be in the conversation for the same jobs, like a lot. And, uh, he would, he would kind of always win out in the end, uh, because, you know, he's just got such a cool style and, and I, you know, like I can get it done, but it, there's, I guess I've kind of gotten better at it over the years where you can look at something and be like, Oh yeah, Mike did that. But, uh, for a long time, again, like it was that thing of like, you know, kind of trying to fit in a lot of different spots and, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I agree. You know, it's one of those things to kind of hit on uh, a little bit of what we were talking about earlier about like this younger generation and where they can pull all of the massive amount of, of media that they can pull from to be inspired and to create. And I see a lot of people who are like our age, older people who are like, who just shun it, who are just like, yeah. Instagram's stupid. Like I, all these people, there's like a million artists on there and they all like, look, you know, it's like, I try to keep out of the old think phase, that whole, like it was better back in my day type of thinking. And, you know, and like, like you, like I will go on Instagram in the morning time and I'll just scroll through and just be like, and get stoked and just be like, God, there's so many people making so much cool stuff. Like it motivates me to keep going because I this is how I make my living and it also motivates me to know that like maybe 25 years ago there were this many people making art there was no way for you to know that no and no way to for you to see it, it being done and uh you know so social media for me has <laughs> that that thing that is great where you get to know what everybody's doing and be inspired by it you know, has that flip side of like, now, now, you know, what everybody's thinking and then maybe you don't need to know all that, but yeah. And, and there's a certain weight to it, right? There's a certain weight to all of that information and like being able, you know, uh, the, the, the competitiveness of like the human psyche, like sort of kicks in and, you know, or just the general, just like I said, that weight of going, fuck man that's a great idea that person's doing it like and putting this like sort of weird pressure on yourself of produce 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 <laughs> and and I, I i get that sometimes you know where i go oh well you know i didn't do anything creative today you know whether it be lyrics or whether it be you know music or art and that weight sometimes gets to me you know and i wait for that moment of inspiration or spark you know and uh, that when the when the mo when the tank is dr like bone dry and that weight is on there, you're like this 
this sucks, man. Like, and <laughs> you want, you want that inspiration to, to kick in. And uh, just like you though, you know, and I, I think we share this, it's that, you know, I, I, I have many wells that I'm sort of like drawing from, whether it be like music or whether it be like sort of, you know, designing something or wear toys or anything like that. Like, I, I have the I have those moments where it's like, oh well, music the well's dry, but maybe you know I was doing uh, a, a poem a day, and I was doing some short stories a day, and I was working on you know a, a full length novel, and, and then a, do a toy, and, and <laughs> trying to just you know sometimes you have to like push the car to actually make the car start. So, so <laughs> like I find myself doing that sometimes where i'm like oh shit like you know got to do something so do something are, are you a visual artist too I, I i'm not aware of of it if you are yeah uh, yeah oh wow cool yeah. I, now i i'm i'm obviously not familiar with the work and i want to check it out <laughs> for sure yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's on you know it's, it's on my instagram and it's just things that i what's do your, I, what's your instagram handle i totally spaced on having you give out all your all the places people could find all the things you do. So why don't you just throw that out there now? Uh, my Instagram is wonderland war and it's with a U and not an O. Uh, but uh, you could find everything that I do from music to the books that I do and the toys that I do and the visual art that I do. It's all there, you know, and uh, it started uh, visual art wise, probably about four, five years ago i was doing a lot of like graphic design uh but on the visual side i just started doing skulls digitally on my phone like on a, like a wonky weird like oh yeah this stuff's uh, really great dude well thanks man uh and i started <laughs> doing a, a skull a day right so uh i didn't know shit about it so on my phone i would take my finger and i would make a skull and i would do everything out right and I'd go, oh, okay cool and then i would save it and i would be I'm in Bowling Green, Kentucky today. So the skull is Bowling Green, Kentucky, and here's the skull. And I just continue to do it. And the visual art that I've done, especially with the skulls, it's all just done on my phone. Like I just do it with my finger and like I get weird. And, and, but it's something that when I feel, when I feel like out of who I am, that visual art side of what I'm doing, it, it centers me more than anything else. So I've been riding that train a lot, you know, through like pandemic and through <laughs> things like that. And uh, I've, I've found visual art to be my like sort of solace of, of, of just, I could center myself and I can kind of do what I want and, and no one's there to critique. And I put it up if I really want to, if I don't want really want to, it stays saved in a folder and locked away fucking who knows you know until i hit delete you know <laughs> dude that's rad like um are you familiar ah oh, god I, I i i don't i i follow i subscribe to a youtube channel and i don't know i can't come up with the name of the actual artist but his channel is struthless and i don't know if that's his art name um but he's like an australian guy and for a long time, his channel was kind of like, uh, it seemed like it was kind of just like informational about what it's like to be a professional artist. And it was like, you know, he would show his work and every now and then he'd talk a little bit about the process. But then in the last few months, he really started burrowing down on some deeper shit about what it's like to be an artist and like mental health stuff and mm -hmm. But he has this one episode where he, for a, when he started out, he was interning for this very famous couple in Australia who make these, they make these like fiberglass rabbits. I guess they're very famous. I don't, I, okay. I, I wouldn't know who they are anyway, but he was like interning for them and he was like working there for a long time. And he was like, every day he was like, he would make art. But nothing was really catching on. He wasn't like getting anywhere with his own art. And he asked the guy he was working for, like, what, what's the problem? Like, what, what's going on here? And, um, and this, this relates to your skull thing a little bit. I am not off on a tangent, <laughs> um, as I want to do at times. But um, so, and the guy was like, you draw something different every single day. And he's like, well, yeah, that day I'm an artist. Like, that's kind of what I'm supposed to do. And the guy's like, no, that's the wrong thinking. He's like, what you were doing is 
you are putting down a brick on a wall. And then the next day you're putting down a new brick on a new wall. He's like, keep putting bricks on the wall until you have a wall. Draw the same thing every single day for a year, just as an experiment and see what happens to you. And like it, you know, he was able to blow up his entire art career because he's started drawing this crane that's like this, you know, this bird. And then like he drew the bird every single day. And then of course, once he got good at drawing the bird and it was natural, then he started do adding things to the bird yeah. and doing all of these other things. And he became totally well known for this one Instagram thing where he does these birds. And, you know, I was talking to a sculptor on my personal um, art page <clears throat> about this a little bit. And, you know, and, and it, it, you know, like, like really profound to me where it was like, and I am the opposite. I put down a new brick every day, every <laughs> damn day. Um, but it, I mean, it works for me, you know, it works for me. And, um, but like, and, and I think it's cool as that relates to your sculpting, where it's like, you're doing your sculpting and every day, depending on where you are, where your head's at, or where you are actually literally, you know, geographically, like you can make some piece of art out of that same concept and have it be totally different. That's, you know, I'm all about that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, it, it's I, I took that idea. It was weird because it was uh, an art teacher from high school. And I, I remember just kind of talking. And I, I was in a punk band then, right? And we were kind of like talking about music. And, and, and uh, they said to me, hey, if, if you're going to be an artist, pick one thing and then do that thing right and do it over and over and over and over again. So anytime that I've ever started anything, I've always had that headspace. Okay, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it like this. So I started to make resin toys. So it's a, a skull resin toy. It has the logo of paper and plastic with the cross in it. Mm -hmm. So I made 300 variants on that one skull, you know, and dropped them 10 at a time or 30 at a time or whatever, right? And uh, I, I, in the back of my mind for decades, it's always, if you're going to do it and do something new, stick with the one thing, but like grind on it so hard that it starts to be your own. And, and, uh, I, I started to, to really understand that with, uh, the skulls where I went, I really want to do more art, but I'm traveling and I can't bring I don't want to bring an iPad and I, that would be, I have to buy this iPad and I don't, I didn't want to go into uh, Photoshop. I don't want to bring my computer around because I'm on a flight or I'm on a bus or I'm doing whatever. So I went, well, I'm going to have to find something on my phone. And it's this thing called memo pad, which is like this like <laughs> weird, like wonky thing. Right. And mm -hmm. no offense to memo pad folks. You get it, right? But, uh, I, I open it and finger and, and start doing it and fill it in and, and start to get weird with it and then start to like, you know, kind of uh, grind on it a little bit and start to figure things out. But uh, I just was using for the skulls, just using what I had available. And that was just something, you know, on my iPhone and just let it happen. And just goes to, you know, when I have told, you know, people about that, you can do whatever you want, man. If it's a stone, and you want to like do whatever with it, like you could find them everywhere. If you want to, you know, whittle or you want to do this or that, just, you know, create with what you have. And that doesn't mean that you have to go buy, you know, uh, you know, X, X iPad, or, you know, you don't have to have a huge monitor and you don't have to do all these things. They're great for commercial work and they're great, but that's not what we're talking about. It's just personal art. Man. <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah. Now that's, now I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to do like an Instagram where I draw the same thing every day and see awesome. what happens with that just for the fun of it, you know, because my problem is, is that I love to draw and I just don't get I just don't draw enough because I'm so busy with all my, you know, one billion different projects. I'm working on toys. I'm working on album covers. I'm working. And it, sometimes my album cover work requires me to draw and sometimes t-shirt stuff does but sometimes it doesn't and if i could find something where it's like i'm going to sit down and draw for the for 30 minutes every morning and i'm going to put that thing even 
15, 10, five minutes yeah. um, and just throw that up on an Instagram. I think I'm going to do it. I think you've inspired me <laughs> to do it. <laughs> you should. It, it's, it's one of those things that at a, at a certain point, man, it, it's, you know what you're going to do. There's no guesswork. There's no startup. It's, Hey, I'm going to draw this glass of wine every <laughs> fucking day for forever. Right. And, and that's what you're going to do. And then all of a sudden you're the glass of wine guy. I mean, how, how cool would that be? <laughs> yeah uh i yeah my now 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 my brain is working and i should be p paying attention to what we're doing and you've <laughs> lit a fire in there and i don't dare tell my wife because she'll be like you don't need um another project to do yeah. you fucking jackass yeah. <laughs> she's like because this yeah. podcast she she loves the podcast and it, she pushed me really hard um, to do this. And so she doesn't complain about the podcast, um, at mm. all. And she doesn't complain about my toy work because that's where, you know, that's where I make my money. But sometimes she's like, why are you doing a t-shirt for that amount of money? I'm like, cause that's what I do. And sometimes it's not about the money. You know what I mean? But you know, I, 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 I would hate for anybody to think that my wife complains at me about anything. When I say that she did, she, it's just, she sometimes, needs me to focus in a different place than I'm focusing. Um, and sometimes I need her to do that for me because, because I'll, I'll be off in the weeds somewhere. Like I'm going to write a book of poetry. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I've got too many other projects going on, but yeah, she's, she's amazing with the podcast stuff. Like, uh, I, I did like a test episode and when we were done, she was like, you're good at this. Like you're good at this and we're going to, we're going to go for it. <laughs> and then here we are <laughs> 50 awesome. some odd uh, you know, it, it, episodes it's later cool to be able to, to find something new. Right. And that you feel natural doing and you know, there's not, there, there's not enough things in the world that are like that. Right. So it's cool when you find that and, and you're able to go, Hey, this feels natural. So I'm, I'm going to do it. Right. Like, and there's people go through their whole life never find that one thing that they feel natural at everything feels like you know it's a it forced into doing it you know you're forced into you know trying to fit in and, and and fit in the headspace but it's beautiful that you be able to find multiple things that you go oh, i feel comfortable doing this this is great <laughs> I've, yeah. been, I've been very lucky in that way man i think a lot of us you know well you know i don't know how much of it is um, you know, I was talking to, to Kristen Farrell about this a little bit, like the, the nature versus nurture of, of the, of the world that, you know, kind of the, the subcultures that, you know, that we exist in, whether it's, you know, like underground artist, underground musician, whatever. Um, and I don't know if it, if, if it's inevitable, um, that certain people like, like us end up in that scene if it's like we're gonna find it no matter what we do with ourselves or um or if it's ex if it's an exposure thing you know where we exposed to something that that put it in our mind to go that way and i and I, I honestly think it's kind of a little bit of both but i really do believe that uh so those of us who do this for life like there's no option there's no other, there is no other option for me. Like I was going to make my living as an artist and I was going to be in bands and I was going to do all these things because I didn't really have any choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you, if, if you're a creator, you're going to create man, like by, by any means necessary. So, and, uh, if you're lucky enough to be able to create and, and be able to, you know, pay your bills and, and, and live as a creator, man, that's a, that's a, a, a gold medal you want, right? <laughs> uh, I don't disagree. Because I, I do know, I do know a lot of people that super talented and, and create every day, but mm -hmm. have not been able to, you know, connect the dots and be able to make it a, a, like a, a real gig, right? And so, uh, but they continue to create and they continue to be awesome and inspiring. Uh, and they'll get there, man. I, I, I have no doubt. Right. But at that moment, you're just creating and you're, you're that output is more and more and more and more and more until you can connect the dots. And sometimes that's luck. Sometimes it's timing. Sometimes that's a lot of things, but, uh, it's not necessarily talent because I know a lot of talented motherfuckers that like can't connect those dots. And I know a lot of people who are mediocre at best who do 
really, really well. And when I say mediocre at best, I just mean um, my understanding of like technical artistic ability uh, and, and some arbitrary thing that I'm putting on it. Like, I'm not trying to say I'm the fucking guy who knows everything about what and what mm-hmm. is and isn't good. But, you know, there I know some people who uh, I personally believe them like maybe I'm a better graphic designer or illustrator uh, that like smoke me like they their their career is just you know destroys anything like I could never dream to have gotten to the places that they've gotten to and oh. I'm not bitter or mad and I don't hold any like whatever man like <laughs> like if you can make that happen for yourself that's fucking rad and I'm stoked for you uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'll call myself out I'm the world's most okayest drummer right <laughs> and no you're uh, pretty good like, even no, though no, i don't really I, I, necessarily I care good. for that music you're a good drummer in, dude in the in the i'm not even this is not even trying to get like a, oh i'm a decent drummer but i'm just saying that in the scope of just starting and being fucking awesome right i'm <laughs> at the world's most okayest drummer but that took me around the world. Like it doesn't gauge. I'm not fucking Neil Pert or Brooks Wackerman or Josh <laughs> Freeze or Travis Barker or whoever. But like, I'm okay drummer. But like, I did it enough and was lucky enough and hard work and all the other things. And it ran around the world and played in front of a bunch of people and did a bunch of cool shit and did a bunch of records and yeah. wrote music. Like, and that just goes. It's a testament of of everything that we're talking about. You know, it's the output daily. It's the hard work daily. It's the luck and the timing and the lightning. Like it's all those things that like when you're living in a a creative orbit, it's all those things, man, that are awesome, man. That if you're doing all those and all those things are happening, that's, that's the race that I want to be on. And that's the race that I always wanted to be in. Dude. Yeah. That's, (laughs) that was really, that was an amazing insight for sure, dude. Like, it's that thing, you know, and it, you know, this show has a lot of reoccurring themes and I have people on and a lot of the same conversations happen because, you know, we all do this, yeah. you know? And so, uh, but it's that whole thing of like, you have to be willing to do whatever it takes to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have to make some hard choices in your life and you, and you have to understand that there are people in your life who are never going to understand the decisions that you make, whether it it's, I'm not going to work on this project and I'm going to work on that one too. Um, like, you know, I'm going to be gone for six months on tour. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's like, it's all of these things. And, um, so you have to be willing to do what it takes to, you know, kind of live your authentic self in, um, and you have to, uh, it, you know, I was on another podcast. I was on the Sound Sisters podcast, and you know, uh, we talked a little bit about that. Where it's like you just you you can't let anybody make these decisions for you. Because um, once you do, then you're out. You're gone. You're you're done. Uh, you you have to be true to who you are, and you have to find people in your life who are willing to understand that and come al- and even if they don't come along with you they understand where you're going uh and what it means to you to do it and and so you just you have to be prepared to do what it takes you have to be true to who you are and what you want to do with yourself and then you can't ever give up on it you know what i mean like every yeah. single one of us has gotten to the point where we're, where we're like i'm busting my ass and i am not seeing anything for this like but that doesn't matter because no. uh, one of the great constants of being a creative person, and I don't have never met another creative person who didn't also kind of have the same struggle, is there's that ever elusive next level. You know, you're oh, yeah. like, you're where you are, and you're like, well, I wanna be there. And so you're constantly like trying to level up, and, but you're, even when you get to where you had set that kind of goal, you never see it unless you stop and really consciously take a look. And, and almost invariably every one year, three years, five years, 10 years of your artistic life, whether you're a musician or whatever, if you stop and you look at it and you're like, Oh shit, now I'm playing with bands that, 
I could have never dreamed of five years ago. And then, you know, maybe five years later, you're like, oh my God, I'm headlining over these bands that I could have never dreamed I'd even play with. And But you never see the forest for the trees a lot of the time because you're, it's that drive. You know what I mean? It's that drive that we have to always constantly make things. And, you know, that, that, Next level isn't necessarily even about money. It's about an internal gratification Uh Um, because it's hard to get validation internally. It's easy to get validation from people for your art because people want to, because you get fans, you know, and they, and they're, and they're on your team, but inside of yourself, you know, like I can't imagine there'll ever be a day where I'm like, that's perfect. And I'm going to love that thing forever because I swear, no matter how perfect I think it is right now, a week from now, I'm going to be like, I can do that totally better. <laughs> oh, yeah. No matter what it is. I, you know what, there's not, and not even to make it like a heavy conversation, but my hardest critic is myself, Ben. Like, of course. And it's never, and it's never good enough is never good enough. Like, and it's, and that's, you know, sort of that, that curse that you live with, you know, it's that I should be like celebrating the moment and all the other <laughs> bullshit that's like written on fucking like, you know, cards and stuff and on memes and all that. And like, gotta live, laugh, moment. love, bro. You gotta yeah, live, yeah. laugh, love. <laughs> I, I've, never, I've, never been, I've never been that. And it, it, has, it has to be a reason why I found punk rock how I did. Like there's something in, inside inherently that it's just like, you know, a little bit angry and a little bit like, you know, I, I have to fight against whatever is out there, you know, and like it makes my it makes me grind a little bit more than than other people. You know, and I look at other people who have like a, a slight smile on their face and they're giving me the like the like polite nod. I'm going, <laughs> I wish I could be you, you motherfucker. Like I, I want to be the slight smile, like head nod guy. Like, oh, this is great. Like it's fine like this is but i'm never that guy like i'm like forever an internal curmudgeon like about (laughs) everything creative like but i do have a story right about uh people like sort of in your in your orbit catching up to like what you're doing right so mind you this there there's a moment in time uh where uh, bon jovi right was uh, staging a comeback and uh, it was his crush uh, the, the the crush album right and uh, I, I don't remember that at all because okay, Bon okay. Jovi does uh, not exist in my universe really at so, all. <laughs> so so here, here is it, right? Where like they're going on tour and they're having a comeback, and it's you know it's where he cut his hair short, and does the whole thing, right? And uh, mind you, during that time, Less Than Jake played like uh, the Reading and Leeds Festival to like eighty thousand people, ninety two thousand people, like big shows, huge things, signed to a major label, all that. My brother, who's a metalhead, four years older than me, could give a rat's ass. Like, Vinny, how you going? Dude, we played the Reading Festival, 90,000 people. Cool. 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 <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Uh, and uh, never never was a cheerleader, never got behind it, was just like, whatever. And I, it's not that I, I thought he didn't understand. I think he understood, but just didn't give a shit. Until <laughs> one morning, Saturday morning, I get a call from our manager who says, hey, through some like weird like uh you know occurrence bon jovi's booking agent saw you play in new york city is interested in less than jake opening up for bon jovi on the east coast i go yeah, like I'll, I'll talk to everybody and like we're all metalheads and and less than jake like that's just sort of what we are right so everyone says yes everybody's stoked it's so weird that we're gonna tour with bon jovi and and not like we're the opener, then there's a middle band like Winger or Black and Blue or Kicks, right? Like none of that. Uh, uh, it's less than Jake, 30 minutes after Doors. We play for a half hour, a half hour break, then Bon Jovi comes on and plays for two and a half hours, right? So Wow. And I call my brother up right after we, we like, you know, uh, confirm. I go, hey, like, uh, what are you doing? Nothing, Vinny. I go, hey, I have something to tell you right now. And he's like, okay. I go, hey, we just confirmed that we're going to tour with Bon Jovi. And silence. (laughs) All of a sudden, I hear just lightly speaking to me, hey, I'm I'm super proud of you. 
Like, <laughs> That's awesome. And, and, and never, and never told me it ever. I never told me it ever again. But that moment, he was like, "I am so proud of you. Super proud." And I was like, <laughs> "There it is. Like, how do you understand everything?" Uh, dude, totally. That fucking you. You know, there's those spots in life where you get validation uh, from from places that. Um, either you weren't expecting or you could have never expected, uh, you know, <laughs> that's awesome, man. I love that. And just the fact that you guys, you know, toured with Bon Jovi is that's, I, I, I seem to remember that Bon Jovi's like comeback stuff was very, very different than the Bon Jovi of the eighties too. It was like, you oh, know, yeah. just kind of like a, adult acoustic, acoustic music almost. Right. They, they and so cool like you guys them. couldn't be told, couldn't be more different than, <laughs> than Bon Jovi at any stage of Bon Jovi's career. No, I mean, we were at that time we were, uh, you know, super fast ska with like, you know, punk rock, like, you know, inspiration that's, you know, in it, it was, apples and oranges but you know what uh the funny thing about that whole thing it you know bon jovi they were on the comeback and you know they asked everybody at the moment you know uh, smash mouth and sr71 and eve six hey bon jovi's going on tour they're interested in you having you know the opening and every single one of those bands that had hits at the radio at the time were like we're not interested. Bon Jovi's like washed up and <laughs> this, we're not interested. <clears throat> and they couldn't find somebody to open that, you know, sort of had, you know, uh, some type of drugs, this and that. And they came to see us play and they went, this band is fun. And this is, this is what we need. And uh, right after that, they went to radio and it was the song. It's, it's my life, but it, it's, it's oh, my life song. Right. Right. And, it got on the radio. It got huge. It got, you know, brought them back to like, you know, we were, we were playing arenas, right? 17,000 sold out. And to their team's credit and to Bon Jovi's credit, when they started to get hits at radio and those bands and those agents came back and said, we'll take the tour. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll do the thing. And they went, we offered it to you, man. And you <laughs> said, no, we're never, we're like, that's our band. Like, and they're coming with us and they're going to be on tour with us. And I give them such props, man, that like they made their decision. They stood by like a bunch of like weird, like punkers, like middle aged <laughs> men punkers with like a horn section. And it was fun and, and, and cool. And, and it was the most unlike thing that we've ever done. And it was righteous at the end. I was like, I would do that over again a thousand times. That's amazing. Uh, a little side note, a little side side uh, story. If anybody on earth, including you, doesn't follow the singer for Eve Six on Twitter, oh, they do. definitely should. <laughs> He's like the best Twitter ever because he just like makes fun of Eve Six and every other band of that like mid nineties to late nineties, like um, you know, kind of uh, rock radio oh, yeah. uh, list of bands, and it's it's hilarious. That dude is hilarious yes the, I, I i also uh, am a, a fan of the eve six twitter accounts right and, and just because we we were going to radio we were playing a lot of radio shows around that same time and for him to like sort of nail some of the bands i'm like but what, what he's saying is not wrong like you know and he's kind of including his band in that too so right i could give him a pass you know there's a lot when, of self-deprecation in there <laughs> when, 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 you know when he when he's taking the piss out of like the harvey danger guy and like you go oh yeah like you know but you were the same band marcy's playground like to me like back then i was like yeah it could be anyone just like you know there's other people who are like aren't you guys like in real big fish isn't real big fish and like it's the same thing like yeah I, and i get it right like yeah, uh, yeah so there was a few of you guys that i i wouldn't have probably been able to tell apart at the time huh. uh, you know uh just like i would have no idea what deicide and morbid angel and like I, I don't know like if those guys stumbled fair. over me i'd be like ah, i don't know who this is this is yeah, it's could totally be fair. deicide like morbid angel it could be you know, down the line, some crazy, you know, but I was a fan, Slayer, Celtic Frost, mm -hmm. Exodus, mm -hmm. like thrash mm -hmm. metal. I was huge, huge, huge fan. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. Napalm Death, like 
I love like, I like that sort of like just blast, like the blast beat craziness. Like I dig it, man. As a personal anecdote to that, uh, Napalm Death is probably in my top 10 favorite bands ever since like, since I first heard their, their demos and stuff in like 87, 88. And I have never seen them live. Oh. And there's no good reason for it. Uh, yeah. Other than once I decided that I, that was going to be my mission, uh, they they kind of stopped doing those big package tours and they do like, oh, we're playing the Troubadour with Melt Banana and like the tickets would sell out in like 30 seconds. And then like, and then, <laughs> so I haven't been able to see, I've, it's one of those things. And and like people who are friends with me are like, that that isn't even real. Like you're making that up, dude. <laughs> it's like, no, sorry. And they might be the only band active uh that i haven't seen that i would like to see uh the only at the only aside from them like one of the only other bands i'll never get a chance to see that i'm really disappointed is minor threat like mm -hmm. minor threat was like that was my band for a lot for like for most of my life and when i listen to old hardcore now they're still so much better than every other band in that Pretty like they were that. on something way different than everybody else and just to know that i'll never get a chance to see them is kind of a bummer i mean i got to see the misfits and i got to see helicopters and i got to see a bunch of bands that mean a lot that were broke up and came back but nah, even if minor threat isn't going to but even if they decided to i don't think i would i don't think matter. i would <laughs> i just don't think i would I was stoked to see the Misfits though, but that's because I raised my children on the Misfits. It's the family's favorite band. And so when I had a chance to take all of my kids to see the goddamn Misfits, we went and it was fucking awesome. <laughs> and we like, uh, but yeah, anyway, no, I, digression. <laughs> I, I, now that we're talking about like Napalm Death, right? Uh, I, it was uh, when enslavement to obliteration first came yeah. out, right? So Vito was, records good. I was 17 at the time, no 16 at the time. Right. And I was on a beach in Englewood, Florida, and we had a 12 pack of Milwaukee's best. And we about half as you do. <laughs> yep. I, we were halfway through it. And we, we were on our second joint of, of dirt weed. And my friend said, Hey, I got this cassette of napalm death. Like, uh, you you, you want to hear it? I go, I don't even know what that is. And it's like, oh, it's so fast. It's going to be crazy, right? And I go, yeah, let's, let's listen to it. We put, had a huge boom box. He puts it in there, turns it up really loud. It's going wild. And in that moment of it going wild, like within like, and they're like super short songs. So by the 10th song, literally after like two minutes, right? <laughs> I, I look outside the beach and there's a school of dolphin that are so close to the thing and just so serenely like making their way <laughs> past the sandbar and just i'm out of my brain and but uh in, in sleeping through obliteration just uh, on 10 crackling and it's just screaming in my ear but there's a serene like school of dolphin just like cruising right by it forever that that will stay with me forever that that's like the best napalm death story I've ever heard. And I've heard, and I've heard a few. <laughs> I fucking love it. That's amazing. Um, yeah, you know, and, and, and here's a, here's an interesting thing, how that kind of ties back into a little bit about where we were talking about being a creative person and, um, and the things that maybe people who aren't us don't understand, uh, is like, a lot of us have this associative mind where um, we see a thing and it's connected to another thing and we can never disconnect those things. Um, like uh, there was like a meme that somebody shared and me and some other artist friends were talking about where this woman was like, you know, my dad thinks I'm crazy because, you know, like we were at a baseball game and he, you know, mentioned a mosquito. And then I started talking about this other thing and he couldn't understand how I would connect them. And in my mind, the other thing happened and I got bit by a mosquito. And now whenever I think of a mosquito, I will always think of this one thing. And for me, like there's like a, there's an endless amount of those things. But like, as an example, like, um, when I was like five years old, 
one time I was walking out of the house and I opened the door and I was looking at the TV on the way out and there was like a Snickers commercial. And so every single time, 50 years later that I see a Snickers bar, I think of that door handle. I can't not think of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a brain full of that shit. And the fact that you have that with Napalm Death and Dolphins makes my whole life yeah. that it, much better. It, it, it's right there forever. It's just, <laughs> it's Are you familiar that. with the band Intronaut? Mm-mm. They're like kind of like a prog doom. Amazing. The, the, the nicest guys that I know and the, some of the most talented musicians. Are you familiar with Dunnable Guitars? No. Okay. Sasha Dunnable uh, is the singer guitar player for Intronaut. He also owns and operates Dun- Dunnable Guitars. You awesome. know, he makes a beautiful instruments. Shout out Sasha. But their band has this running uh, joke with like dolphin stuff. And I'm going to tell him to listen to this so he can hear the dolphin napalm death story because he will absolutely <laughs> love it. Him and Joe, the bass player. <laughs> That's great. Um, <laughs> uh, what. You know, one of the things about this show uh, is that um, when I started it, I I went and I found people to be on the show. And one of the things that's been super amazing to me uh, is that people now come to me frequently to be on the show. And I, I'm just it's humbling to me uh, that anybody wants to come and be <laughs> come come and be on here and talk to me about stuff. Um, but you were one of the people who came to me uh, cause you were a fan of the podcast and dude, that's super rad. Like yeah. I, I really appreciate that. And, yeah. and so not knowing a whole lot about, you know, all the things you had going on, I had to like educate myself pretty fast about it. Um, uh, but I, I do, there's some, there are some empty spots. Uh, is, was, is there anything in particular related to the label that you have going on that you wanted to talk about? Or were you just here to just chat about art stuff or? You, you know what, the, the, anytime that I could, that I could find somebody who I, I think could be like potential, like sort of like kindred spirit, you know, talk about punk rock music, talk about art, talk about whatever. I, I, I want to talk to those people, right? Like that's sort of my like inquisitive mind that I have, but like, for me, like, I, I the project that I'm currently working on is the Inevitables, and the Inevitables is sort of ska punk reggae like mashup of music and of players from different bands, but also a comic book, right? So, you know, we did LP one with issue one, and then we did some crazy like dub remixes and had you know uh, Linville from the Specials and and you oh, know wow. a few other guests, and then you know, as we start to write more music and, and are going into uh, LP two and issue two and an origin story of the Florida man, which is the character in the comic book. Like I, I'm just trying to like preach to that going, if you, if you dig this, then there it is. So uh, yeah. Like if, if you're, if you happen to like comic books or happen to like, <laughs> weird doomsday stories or brightly colored like drawings or ska <laughs> punk and reggae like uh what i what i do with the inevitables uh you should just kind of check out man i mean and that's not a hard press of like no hey like i'm on this thing it's that <laughs> uh, when i when i moved away from less than jake i never thought that i was going to write music anymore i thought that the part of my life was over and it happened that through a friend of mine, uh, Obi, who plays uh, in another band called uh, Westbound Train. He just, you know, a friend, and we kind of talked it out, and he was just like, what do you, you know, about eight months after I left, left Less Than Jake, he goes, what do you have going on? I go, nothing, you know, just hanging out. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 no. Like, what do you have going on musically? I go, nothing. He's like, that's bullshit. I know that you have, like, something. I go, well, I had this idea from a long time ago. It was going to be less than Jake, but no one was interested in it. But here's the idea. He goes, do you have any lyrics for it? I go, yeah, some. And he goes, send them to me. And he's like, this, we're going to do this. And, and got other people, you know, got other people involved and we were off then. And just like that, it was, hey, I'm back to writing lyrics and, and talking about music and, and, and helping write music and doing all these things that, I thought that I had just pressed pause on, right? And, or maybe hung up on forever. And it, it was, 
the the journey is cool, man. Like, and at, again, to tie it all backwards, right? Just being a creative, you don't choose sometimes, right? You just it falls, and this inspiration happens, and you start to like claw at it until it starts to form something, and then you go bingo like now 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 we're now we're gonna do it and that was with the inevitables that's that's started in a little bit of sketchy area and kind of sculpted a little bit and see some form and then you go i this is cool let's go let's let's go do this we have been that's amazing i love it i love stories like that um especially stories like uh because i'm in the middle kind of almost an, an exact same type of situation where um like I, I, I had a musing about a, a like a, a thing that would be a funny grindcore band, right? Um, like I was watching Jean Claude Van Damme movies, and I was like, it would be totally hilarious if there was, if there was a, a grindcore band that only had songs about Van Damme, and like I just posted it on Facebook, and then like some of my <laughs> some of my music grind musician friends were like, oh, I'd play on that, and I was like. Oh shit. And then it like, and now it's like being written right now. Right. Like, right. you know, they started like sending me tracks and then it started becoming like, well, let's get this guy to play on this one. So now it's like this crazy, like all-star death grind, <laughs> John Claude Van Damme, uh, record that's getting written right now. And, and I was for sure, I was never going to, uh, be in a band again or ever, be in that type of band again. I, I, you know, I always kind of wanted to do, you know, a little bit more of like a Sonics, uh, you know, kind of old, old, like garage psych type of band. Um, just as a fantasy in my mind, I don't even know if I could sing that way to, to be quite honest with you. I just don't know if I could, but it was always back in there. Like, Oh, you know, something like the mummies or the Sonics would be cool to do. Um, so I definitely never thought I was going to sing in a grind band ever again. So, uh, <laughs> so I can relate a little bit to like the, like a project that started as like this idea that a friend started pulling on the strings of the sweater. And before you know it, <laughs> everybody's got, everybody's got their mitts in it. Uh but that's rad, dude. I, I love that. And I love that, um, you know, and it's sometimes I also do like when our friends, you know, um, t tug us along uh, and they can see something inside of us uh, that needs to be, you know, maintained. Uh, and so I, I do love that your friend was like, no, dude, <laughs> you've got you still got something in there. Like, let's not close the chapter on that. You know, like, that's wow. awesome, man. But the tank's not empty, man. You gotta, you gotta Fuck. let it happen. It's like I have to, uh, you know. Sometimes I have to be perfectly honest. Where I kind of wish there were parts of my tank that would be empty, so I didn't have to entertain them anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I've, I've said it on this show before a bunch of times, and people are probably tired of me saying it, but I could live ten lifetimes, and I would never be able to do all of the things inside of me that I want to do that I would like to do done. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I could live a thousand years and never get them all done. Um, and so sometimes I wish I wasn't always so full of, cause I, the other, the other, the other side of that coin is that I am really, really, really fortunate that I never, ever have, um, I never have like artist block. Like there's never a time right. where I'm like, I, I can't think of what to do here. And I think it's partly because I do so many things for so many different types of things that it's not like I always have to come up with ideas for death metal band t-shirts. You know what I mean? It's like, I have to come up with ideas for all different types of t-shirts. Um, but there's like never been a time that I can remember where I was like sitting around here going, I don't know, I don't know what to make. Like it just doesn't happen to me. Um, of course, it also means that I I don't ever sleep because my brain starts up at like three thirty in the morning with the ideas of like, hey dude, you need to like you got to write lyrics for this project, and then and then and then it's like, oh, you know what? You need to do that thing with the lawn out back, and then it's like, and then wow. it, before I know it, it's like seven in the morning, and I've like completed like seven projects in my mind, and then I actually have to get up and start doing it. <laughs> I, I, I've definitely been there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I say a lot on this show and, and you kind of, you know, you touched on it is that uh, one of the things that I get out of this show that I wasn't expecting 
uh, at all when I started is that I get the, I get new friends that, um, I didn't know <laughs> existed in the world. And, and I'm extremely happy, uh, to know you now and we'll be connected now forever. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll be bothering you on Instagram <laughs> and online all the time about stuff. Now that I know I can like look at your art all the time and I'll, you know, cause I'm just like a fan of so much stuff. And like you said, like, you know, you get up in the morning and you know, you're, you know, you scroll through and it's like, I got to fire up all the engines. And now you are part of the, of the firing of my Same. engines. And, um, <laughs> And you're, you know, just a super cool guy. And, 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 I, you know, anytime I can add a cool new person to my, uh, to my friends list, I'm super excited about it. And I'm glad you reached out and, and wanted to be on the show because, yeah, you know, now, now we got stuff to do. I, I appreciate now it. Now we got stuff to do together. We just got to figure out what it is. <laughs> uh, um, but I think I'm going to let you go uh, back to your Florida. Uh, cold evening. <laughs> yeah, it, it is for real. On that. Uh, 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 but I do appreciate you coming on, man. And uh, I will, uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thanks for having me, man. Of course, man. Thank awesome. you.